Hi there and welcome to Access Chat. I'm really delighted today to welcome one of my colleagues because this is the first time we've talked about some of the activities that uh, we do within the Atos group to help promote accessibility and uh, improve working conditions for people with disabilities. So I'm delighted to have with us today Claire Morjon, who is the coordinator for the Atos Worldline Mission Handicap. So Claire, could you uh, say hi and um, tell us a bit about your, your, your work? Hi everyone. Um, so I'm Claire, I'm French girl, uh, currently working for Worldline and that is subsidiary um, located in 17 countries in the world and I'm, I'm managing a dedicated program about uh, disabled people employment within Worldline France. So um, we, we, we came across each other because we're working together for um, the Wellbeing at Work program, so which yes. is a, a, a diversity, and the particular bit we're working on is the diversity initiative within that. Um, I'm very interested to, to, to talk with Claire because the, the, the Mission Handicap program is a fairly well structured program. It's a, a, you know, you can tell you tell us about the you know the, the structure of it because I think it's it's very interesting because it's it's contrasting from from the way that we do stuff in the UK. Uh, it's yeah slightly different uh, <laughs> because um, it's it, in fact we're not the only company uh, who has a mission handicap. Uh, I think it appeared uh, the proper term um, during the year 2000, something like that, and it's uh, really linked to the the French law because French law imposes uh, quotas of disabled people um, in each company that have more than 20 employees, and. Um, it, we can have programs to develop such um, politics and that's my work and this politics is actually based uh, upon a union's agreement we, we signed uh, with um, uh, unions and employee representatives uh, in the ETHOS group since 2008 and um, it's a really organized program because it's based upon this uh, this text, this union's agreement that describes every action we can do or we cannot do and it's also um, under the state's administrative control. That means those agreements um, can be uh, countersigned by the state and if the state's administration countersign uh, the document, uh, we have to report to the state's administration plus the employee representatives. So that means it's really structured program, so I have to report, I have to prepare in advance what I will do the, ne the, year, the next year and in addition to this program I also have the diversity topic with uh, you and other the global business units representatives in the world group at us. Mm -hmm. If someone has right. a question, no problem. <laughs> yes, I, I do have one. Uh, what is the role um, of uh, the groups uh, of people with disabilities? What what uh, the organizations and associates that that work w w with, the, with with disabled people? What is their role on, on that program? What is their role? Yes, what they do, what their responsibility. Um, in fact, uh, it's people with disability can um, um, work for the the program, but uh, it's not really. It's a program dedicated to uh, hire more disabled people. Um, guarantee them um, a fair uh, path career and um, and adjust their workstations. And indeed, um, the the group of people who is uh, working for the 
the mission uh, handicap friends we are actually uh, we are right now seven people working in this to deploy uh, and implement this program and some people with disabilities can work for this program like anyone uh, but there's no it, it can be linked uh, by the fact that disabled people can work for the program as as uh, they can work in any any team uh, or any for any job in the whole group uh, depending on the fact that the their workstation is adjusted or not uh, um, so th their role can be being um, a part of the the team coordinating the program or their role can also be uh, being the um, the um, users <laughs> of the this program so w when this type of program is being evaluated so you have the unions you have companies do you also have the associations of people with disabilities at the table no, we don't. Uh, in fact, we are working uh, uh, with uh, associations because uh, we all know that uh, parents' associations, uh, for instance, uh, struggle very hard in the very um, for the um, disabled people um, and disabled children, for instance. But there are no they're no not part of the negotiations or the program, but. The union's agreement uh, says that uh, we we can or we must work with um, disabled people associations to to try to find some path, some way to work better together. For instance, uh, the disability quota in French companies can be um, achieved by. Um, uh, contracts with um, um, shelter, sheltered workshop suppliers, uh, for instance, to clean our uh, parking car parks, to clean our um, our buildings, um, to buy also uh, some communication. Um, Staff, like for instance, I, I I managed the creation of a 2016 calendar with uh, testimonials from our uh, disabled employees and their manager or their colleagues, and this calendar was done by um, third uh, um, sheltered workshop uh, company, and we are we have suppliers that are um, uh, associations that are shelter workshops also and in their legal structure there are associations so that's those kind of link we can make with a disabled people association okay so I'm, I'm sure Deborah's got a question you're on mute Deborah you're on mute Deborah <clears throat> yes I yeah I, I'm unmuting right now you, Claire in the in the United States um, we have started deciding that sheltered workshops um, are taking advantage of people with disabilities and I myself have a daughter a 28 year old daughter that has Down syndrome and the problem with deciding that all sheltered workshops don't are not effective I think is throwing the old saying uh, the baby out with the bathwater because the reality is that many of my daughter's peers you know if they didn't have some kind of you know, workshop or some kind of organized way that they could work, many of them would not be working. And so I personally think that you got to look at the program, you got to look at the outcomes, you got to look at what we're achieving. And so applause to ATOS for looking at all these different things. Um, I am curious, not really knowing the workshop as well as, I mean, that's why we're interviewing you, but um, so the, besides, you know, looking for opportunities to outsource work to partners like the one you mentioned with the calendar and making sure that people with disabilities that are qualified to do work with ATOS, um, do you actually, does your group help uh, individuals that are qualified to do jobs at ATOS find jobs? 
Is it more um, working with the unions and the representatives, making sure that the opportunities are there? Yes, we do. It's a, another part of the, um, the program. But shall I maybe um, precise uh, what we what are the form of the workshops in France? Because there are really, there are two types of uh, sheltered workshops in France. Um, those uh, where only people who got um, or oriented. I don't know if, I, if it's correct, by the the state's administration can work in. Uh, this is a, a first uh, kind of. And those structures, there are uh, specialized educators. For instance, one of my very close friends work, worked in as a social worker in a particular uh, shelter workshop, which is a theater company. And if the people are uh, entering those workshops, um, they, they are there for the whole time, their whole life, for instance. And there is a really big, big queue for any uh, um, for those workshops to go in because there are two people and um, parents have to wait uh, for the state's authorization to go in. And there is another type of shelter workshop, which are proper companies under a specific uh, level, and they are companies. And the people are um, employees. Like, for instance, tomorrow, uh, if I got a big disease and I apply to have the disability uh, document uh, for workers in France, I can myself work into uh, the second type. But if I want to apply uh, for the first type, I will have to prove that I that my disability it's is so um, um, it's so. Um, so, Hard? Yeah, yeah you, so, so you've, you've, you're looking at different levels of disability, right? Yes, so, right. So the first level of, of workshop is for, for people with profound disabilities, whereas uh, the second level, which are the more companies, are um, open to anyone that, that meets the minimum criteria yes. set by the government. Yes. So, um, and, and the second level of the companies are, the, uh, are generally, am I right in thinking those are the ones that we work with more? We 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 work with both, um, and uh, for the first type, it's it's m more about m uh, mental disease, like uh, really um, like trisomia. I don't know if the word is correct. Trisomia twenty one. It's okay. like really um, it's more about mental disease in those first types, and uh, to to follow my answer. Uh, in fact, the biggest part of my work is um, to find solutions uh, to hire more uh, disabled people it really in, related to our job, to what we do in this company. Like, it, it, there's no way that we hire someone only because uh, that person is uh, disabled. Uh, recruitment uh, is always a matter of skills and motivation. I can tell you that because <laughs> I did seven years of recruitment, it was no way that we recruit someone that has not the skills uh, required by the, the position and not the motivation to enter a group and a team. And um, no matter what they are disabled or not, it's the same for everyone. And but the the big problem now in France and as far as I know in Europe, it is there is um, a skill uh, there deficit. is a skill issue yeah deficit, deficit issue because our you, you 
we uh, we all know this probably, but um, we are an engineering company. An engineering company means specific qualifications in IT uh, skills, uh, like development languages or uh, technical um, skills in the web network, for instance. And the thing is, right now, in and that means um, um, master's degree. That means delivered by universities or engineering schools. And actually, right now, the, the unemployed people with declared disabilities are, for in France, seventy percent of them qualified under the um, the baccalauréat and uh, the, um, the SAT uh, in America. So there is a huge gap between our <laughs> recruitment needs and policy and the qualification of people to apply. And that's why we also have partnerships with specific um, training center for uh, disabled people to to um, um, improve their qualifications. We, and we also have specific partnerships with uh, universities, Mission and DECAP, to find solutions uh, to keep seeing uh, pupils uh, in high school, for instance, that they can do. Uh, um, master's degrees or uh, degrees at the university, and because we 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 know that sometimes uh, the parents or even the schools or administrations are um, um, not always willing and pushing the disabled pupils to go further. I can say this because I have several discussions with uh, um, disabled people and that some of them told me that uh, after um, being to uh, middle school uh, some of their teachers told them, "Say so you, that's good, that's good." And after the baccalaureate, that's it's enough. <laughs> Not, don't, don't go further. And we want to say that it's possible. And we, there are do jobs. <laughs> yeah. so well, and and I would just say, Claire, that in the United States we have that exact same problem. Okay. The bar is being set too low, and. For people with disabilities, a lot, many times um, they're being told they cannot do it. They can't do it. And so applause to the efforts that you are making to make sure that people with disabilities know, yes, you can do it, and working with all the stakeholders to make sure that you're considering it from all the different aspects. So, Antonio, I apologize for interrupting you. So go ahead. No, 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 no you said because um, I've been looking into you know, to employment people with disabilities and to to the role of um, in technology and there are some interesting problems where people can work as role models or ambassadors within the and work with universities to show the students that this it's possible to have a career in, in technology. It's possible to change careers. So I'm interested in knowing if if uh, you are doing any type of work or were working with someone where they can bring people who have successful careers to show them that it's actually possible to move forward. Actually, we, we started doing this uh, this year. But the, the problem is, uh, like you, you, we all know this, is, 80% of uh, disabilities are invisible and we when when we you had a successful career with um, hiding your uh, health troubles um, it's not that easy uh, to say to world hey I had health trouble for 30 years and um, look where I am uh, I, I, I agree, but I think that's something that, that, that I, I feel very strongly because I have a hidden disability, that, I'm, I, that it's my responsibility to advocate for that, to come out and say, yes, this is something that I deal with, but no, it shouldn't be an impediment to success, 
and that you other colleagues, friends, people within other areas of the industry also need to step up and, and, and talk about the issues that you've encountered because we want to create that atmosphere where people can feel comfortable. And I think that this is a change that, um, that has happened with regard to other um, areas of social stigma, like people's sexuality, like gay marriage and, and so on. So I, like, I can liken it to coming out. Uh, I agree. And I've, and I've talked about it as, as coming out about being having a hidden disability because people need to people even people that have declared their disability um, sometimes do something which is which is called masking which is um, you know for instance the the American president Franklin Delano Roosevelt everyone knew right. that he had that he was in a wheelchair but he used to arrive at meetings early and sit behind a table to disguise the fact that he that he was in a wheelchair um, right. pe people cover up for the fact or they don't advocate because they don't want to be seen as causing trouble so I think that we have a responsibility to, to, to talk about it not, not to be belligerent but to talk about it and to, to, to really get people to, to understand that it's okay to be talking about it and to create the atmosphere where it's safe for people to come and talk about yes. it so, th so that we're creating this virtuous circle so that, that we can uh, improve people's expectations and therefore their prospects and and, and it's it's not a not a quick process I agree I have to jump off to go to another meeting I hate to leave this amazing conversation but y'all continue on thank bye you bye Claire Deborah. thank you Deborah. Know you were up at 4 a.m. to get here so we appreciate yes. it <laughs> thank you welcome thank you, thank you. so um, I know that you also do some other stuff with uh, with the Mission Handicap, where you're working with third parties around. Um, you, you have some some part of your budget is set aside for for doing work to improve accessibility. Because when you talk about um, having their their um, what was it your workstation adjusted, you're talking about your working conditions, your computer, the access arrangements. So we're, even though we're speaking in the same language, we're talking a different language. So I'm, I'm, I'm just explaining it for the audience here. So the yes. workstation adjustments are, are the sort of the, the, the assistive technologies, the, the changes to working practices, the, the time differences, right? Uh, you know, you may yes. have flexible working, etc. So, yes. um, so you're doing all of those things. But you're also working with expert communities um, like Atalan uh, to produce guidance for people. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yes. Um, uh, the the purpose, the role of those programs is it has a global uh, objective. That is um, improve um, employment and hiring of disabled people. And in that condition, that means we can have partnerships uh, with um, organizations that are uh, committed to that objective. For instance, if um, we, we all know that to apply for a job it's mostly on the internet and how could uh, um, low impaired people vision apply on websites that are not accessible? And we, ha we all know that we have a lot of progress to make on this topic. I, now, I, I don't want to blame anyone because I know IT engineers uh, and I talk with them every day and they, sometimes they, they, they say that it was really, really, really difficult for them with the, the project guidelines they have to, to do so. And once uh, Atalan came to the editors group and my colleagues um, Flo, uh, to name her, uh, in France and to present a project that led to um, to edit some simple uh, guidances to uh, respect um, RGAA rules. <laughs> Can you say it in English maybe? Because I got the name in French. <laughs> So, so, so RGAA is the uh, French interpretation of the Web Content Accessibility Guideline. Okay. 
Okay. It, it's the implementation, and the latest implementation is RGAA version three, which was signed by Axel Le Maire what late last year into in, into um, legislation. So they they update it from time to time, but um, but it's basically the the the, the the translation of the web web accessibility guidelines with the expectation that that the result will be the same so um, but but these guidelines are very complex uh, and yes. they're very, and they're, and they're not user friendly as well so they're designed by people who understand accessibility deeply not the engineers that are necessarily implementing it so I think that 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 was the purpose behind the project that you were doing with Aqualand. Yes, not. that was it. And the, the final idea was to edit guidances, um, like very easy guidances with uh, screenshots, for instance, and mm, being really practical for uh, graphical designers, for IT, uh, for IT programmers, being really practical and make it. Um, Making the uh, application of those rules um, uh, the most uh, uh, the easiest uh, as possible, and we found we all found that it was a really good idea to support uh, financially those project, and in exchange we had um, awareness uh, disability awareness events or conferences from Atano uh, inside the group. And we also ask a lot of um, engineers to um, to give their opinion about the usability and the and the, um, the usability of those uh, guidances before uh, they they were uh, published. And we were several uh, companies uh, that uh, supported this program. And and we're kind of proud of it. And now we're working a lot more with that. And for instance, I uh, we organize um, digital accessibility trainings uh, for IT engineers, and we we work for what not only those <laughs> guidances. Yeah. So so um, the original guidance was access to web, which is obviously access to the web. Um, I know there's another one, uh, Accede PDF. Yeah, it, it, um, in fact, Accede PDF, Accede PDF first version was the very first project, and we were not part. And we, we started with uh, Accede Web, and there was Accede PDF second version, and we were in too. Okay. Um, and I think you know PDF is a really important thing because there's so many documents out there that are on the web that are PDF and and people forget they'll make their website accessible and then they'll have links to all of these documents saying you can read all about it here and of course then you get it and it's not accessible so it's it's imp it's an important thing um, and and I know that that Worldline are actually doing a whole bunch of other stuff as well so um, I've been working with you on a number of projects which are quite exciting so we're cooking up some some interesting new New developments as well, which we're we're hoping to we'll be able to show the world shortly. <laughs> but, but, so but, you're teasing about it. <laughs> yeah, why not? So um, can't say too much, but uh, but but the, you know the idea is that the accessibility goes across all kinds of modalities. So you know, as a company, we're providing stuff that's not just computers and and so on. But there's other areas of life that we need to address the same kind of issues, so um, we're looking into that as well. Yes. That's all I can say, I guess, right now. <laughs> but uh, I'm I'm kind of excited because I get to come and and, and and play with the toys in a, in, in a week or so. So I'm going to be there for the next Worldline Accessibility Day. So I'm um, excited about that. Yeah. Um, um yeah, Antonio, you asked me a question about how do we guarantee that the recruitment process is accessible. Uh, no, I, yes, I, I was adding th that, uh, but, but Neil, you end up talking about this. Uh, that was just a, a, a generic question that we could you know, talk about, but you just mentioned a few of those topics over the, uh, answering to the, to the last question. 
because the, the idea was basically you know, when we have just to, to explain uh, to the audience if there's uh, someone who uh, uh, that has a disability how we make sure that that person can apply to the job in the same circumstances than anybody else that's okay. I want to answer to this question really <laughs> 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 because when someone applies and has um, disability there there's it's not obliged that that person has made the a formal document to recognize his disability and when that person in France has made this document there's no obligation to her or him to show it to the company or even to talk about it and when we know when we rec the recruitment team knows in the recruitment process that someone has this document or a disability they do the normal process they start the normal process. At some point, they they ask me to go into the um, the process to check out what what kind of adjustment we shall make. But the only condition is knowing it. Uh, I, when I started recruiting uh, recruitment uh, twelve years ago, I remember we had in a job interview a um, deaf person who was uh, mostly speaking sign language. Um, we were not aware of this. Uh, he was probably the uh, wor not worst but the um, most um, frustrating job interview of my life because um, if we knew it before probably we would ask an interpreter to come <laughs> so uh, and that's what we do now like checking the what people what the person needs and organize it and most of the time when I ask what do you need to do your job properly. I don't want to need about your disease and your health problems. It's not my part, it's medical part. I just want to know what you need to work normally without the bad influence or the bad the side effect of your disability or your disease. And most of the people say I don't need anything. So uh, I am open blind, you say. So really, you, I'm not your future manager. You know, I'm from your side. I'm mission handicap. Mm -hmm. So you can tell me what you need and what the difficulties you're facing, and we'll try to to find solutions together with the the work doctor. And sometimes people are. are start talking and uh, I really um, check this and if people continue talking I don't need anything I consider that disabled people know themselves themselves more than anyone else so I trust them Okay. No, that's a, a, a very interesting point that you make. We, we myself, and Neil, and Deborah, and some of the people that we have the pleasure of having on, on Access Chat, or even on uh, other Twitter chats that we participate, uh, we identify that in, in the area of recruitment and human resources, even at university level, this is an area that nobody usually talks about. So when somebody now goes and, and starts their career it depends from your own personal sensibility to understand what is around you yes I, I think that, that, that there's enormous challenges within recruitment um, certainly there is a reticence amongst people with disabilities to disclose not even the people with hidden disabilities but people with with, with um, obvious physical disabilities, they still don't want to talk about their disability in the context before they get the job a lot of the time because they're worried that it's going to prejudice their opportunity to, to, to get that job. So they'll say, oh, I need nothing when actually we do need 
some kind of adjustment and it will make working life better because of the, the, the fear of, of being discriminated against. Rightly or wrongly, people have that fear. I think no, no, and that's also one of the reasons why we were now when we started uh, uh, Access Chat, the the idea of bringing people like uh, that are examples of of what we are talking about here uh, as a way to explain and uh, uh, no uh, the the ideas that we want to express in in, in relation to to recruitment and and, and successful careers. But you know, I, I don't blame people who say um, I don't need anything because sometimes the, those students, for example, young people, don't even know what we're capable of. No, true. <laughs> like, true. For instance, uh, I recruited two, uh, uh, three people in uh, wheelchair in three different locations in France, and um, after the recruitment process. Uh, I organized um, a building um, visits uh, before the, um, the the first uh, day uh, of work, uh, just to check if uh, toilets were okay, if the way for the, the um, restaurants was okay, uh, to uh, organize those things, but. Those they were young people um, under um, 25. They they had no idea that we can do that and how. But uh, it was important to us, like manager, futures manager, myself, and um, uh, um, facility management team, to do to do that in advance to make sure that the first day of, of work will be first day of work and not uh, polluted by other considerations that we could solve earlier. Okay. And but it, they had no idea. It's I think it's also our part to say that we can do something. If we can, we do it. If we cannot, it's another question. But sometimes we had uh, implementing solutions for other people that work. It won't work. It will work maybe for you. Maybe it won't. And um, to say also to disabled people, if you think about solutions, tell us. You you know yourself better than anyone else. If we can um, make the matching of your needs and what we can do, perfect. Everybody will be okay in the end. <laughs> yeah, I I think that's that's a very valid point. We we need to be again talking about our willingness and and, and get people to understand and and. As Antonio said, part of the reason we started Access Chat was to get lots of people, companies and organizations, talking about the work that they're doing because people aren't aware. People tend to keep keep the work like this, the adjustments and so on, quiet. And actually, we should be shouting about what we're doing because we, we want to get people, we want to attract good talent, right? So you yeah. want to attract good talent. So we want people to know that, that, that actually, as an employer, we're willing to, to make those adjustments. We're we're actively proactively thinking about how we can do that, and 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 making sure that we are doing the things like making you know the facilities access the uh, and all and all of the sort of IT adjustments as well. So it's really really important that that we talk about these things out in the open because that's the way that we bring talent in. That's the way that we encourage people to have careers and so on and so forth. We've reached the end of our half hour. <laughs> survived a, a grilling in English, which I wouldn't survive a grilling in French. So thank you very much, Claire. You, you've been a great thank sport. you. Thank you all. <laughs> and, and, and I look forward to you joining us on Twitter tomorrow. Yeah, see you tomorrow. Okay. Bye -bye. See you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.